and I got uh, a total of seven years of experience in testing and around three plus years of experience in APM. So uh, my colleague Jerry also will be taking presentation with me. So Jerry. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry. Is one of the QA engineer in Carousel. Yes. Um, so first uh, presentation is uh, Sham will take this one, and uh, my wife is in the afternoon. So I will show you guys more details in the afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, why don't you guys introduce yourself? You can start from here. Uh, please tell your name and your organization and your expectation from this meetup. Hi everyone, this is Vara. Uh, I'm from Shopback. Uh, I maintain the entire QA there. So I'm with Shopback from almost uh, two plus years. Uh, we have a very nice uh, automation test tool, covers everything set up there. Uh, APM is one of the tools, so I'm just here to learn new stuff. Yeah, enjoy the session. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Hi, this is Venkatesh. Uh, I'm also from Shopback. Recently came from India and uh, joined in Shopback. Uh, now I'm a web uh, automation engineer there. So I didn't have any idea about this APM, so I just came here to know the basics and stuff and everything. Thanks. Thanks, Vangadesh. OK, hi. I'm Kuo Hing. I'm currently a student. So I'm just trying to learn what this is about. OK, thank you. Hi, myself, Morty. Um, I'm working in Titan Soft. Nine years of experience in uh, software testing field. And most of uh, my experience is in the web application. So uh, this is uh, APM is something first I want to try. So today I just want to see how is it goes. Welcome, Moti. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Parium. So I'm an iOS developer at SP Digital. And for today, I'm just like here to see what, what is APM and what it can offer. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Venkat and uh, I'm working in Standard Chartered Bank as an automation engineer. So I want to learn a APM. I already have some POCs done in APM, but I uh, want to learn more about what is in APM. So all the best. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Biju and I am from AIA Singapore. Uh, I'm totally new to uh, mobile uh, development or automation. But recently, I got an opportunity to start a new development, new app development, which Vendor will be doing. But uh, by knowing this, I can give some tips to my management where we can also do some automations for mobile development. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Roy. Uh, I'm from NCS, um, doing front-end development. Uh, so I'm here to just to know more about the tools that you all offer. Uh. Hi, I'm Shireen. I'm from Standard Chartered Bank. So same with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm a product owner and a user experience designer. So I work with a tester to do a lot of testing. So I uh, would like to understand more. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so we split this session to uh, two halves. So during the first half, uh, I will talk about uh, what's APM and the APM architecture and uh, how you can start coding with APM. And uh, afternoon session, then uh, Jerry will give you some tips on how you can develop the APM script effectively. And we will go through the touch action class with APM, you, how you can do the swiping and every other stuff. Then we will discuss about the page object uh, model pattern, how you can design your test cases using POM. Okay, so that's the agenda. So we can start. So uh, before that, how many of you joined the Slack channel? Okay, so if you are not joined the Slack channel, could you please go to this URL, and you can invite yourself to join the Slack channel, so I can share more details on the Slack channel. It's quite easy for me. When you click on this link, you will get this page. You can enter your personal email ID there. So uh, you will get an invitation from me. 
So from where you can sign up for the Slack page. Everyone joined? Okay. Uh, if anyone got any problem for this one, just um or any other question uh, during the session, right? You can just um, just raise your hand, and I can come to your desk and help you guys. Yeah. Okay. So, shall we start? Okay. So, what's up, EM? So, uh, I hope if you're a tester, you might have already experienced with Selenium, right? So, if Selenium is for web, then IPM is for mobile automation. So, what all can do with IPM? So, you can automate uh, the iOS and Android app. So, whether it's a native or hybrid one, you can automate it with IPM. So, you can also automate uh, the mobile browser. So, if you have a a uh, mobile web application, you can automate it using APM. Uh, but there is a limitation. Uh, in Android, you can automate uh, the default browser and Chrome. It won't support any other browser, browsers on Android. And on iOS, it supports only Safari. So now it supports the Windows application also. So if you have a uh, native Windows application, you can automate using APM, using WinApp driver. So the APM APIs are an uh, extension of Selenium. So it uses the WebDriver protocol along with the JSON web protocol. So if you familiarize with APM, all the uh, commands are almost same, like click, enter text, and everything, and send keywords. Almost all the same methods we are using in APM along with some extra methods. Then, uh, which are programming languages to support? So you can see that it supported a number of programming languages such as uh, Java, Ruby, Python, PHP, JavaScript, and C Sharp, and of course, Robot Framework also. So uh, it not stopping you to select your favorite programming language. So if your if your organization is Java based organization, you can just choose Java. If it is not Python, just use Python. So it depends on uh, your whether your organization got the resource for that particular language. So what would be the language you use? So the APM driver can understand what the action need to be done on the mobile device. That's how it works. The APM philosophy. So uh, APM is built based on these four philosophies. The first one, you shouldn't have to recommend your app or modify it in a way in order to automate it. So what it means is that, for example, how many of you use Calabash, head of Calabash? OK, so if you want to use Calabash, then you need to code in Ruby. And you need to compile your app with Calabash source code, right? So if you do it, 
it means that let's say after the uh, after the automation testing passed you want to send this to production directly okay but since you already compile it with calabash source code you are not sending the same app that you really wanted to you need to remove all these things and you need to send the e your code actually so with apm you don't need to recompile anything with any third party tool or anything like that you just test the apk or ipf file what you wanted you send it to production language like i mentioned earlier you can select your favorite programming language so uh, it it's not tying up you to a specific programming language or your team need to learn a new programming language so it avoid all these issues the third one uh, mobile automation framework shouldn't reinvent the wheel when it comes to automation apis so it already reusing the selenium apis so it's not something new that they build so that's the third, the third point the last one a mobile automation framework should be open source in spirit and practice as well as its name it's free you can use it you don't need to pay anything to use apm so it's an open source project yeah this is an uh, a quite outdated big but i can explain this is how the apm architecture look like so on the left side you can see the apm scripts in java so for example driver dot find element by id app id radio dot click so uh, this is a code for clicking on a radio button as a java client so how apm understand that i need to click on a radio button so when you run this program if it is an android android is on the top so what it do with if the uh, android version is uh, greater than 2.3 and less than 4.2 then the selenroid will take care of this one so what it do it has a bootstrap bootstrap.jar so bootstrap.jar can understand the client language so basically when you uh, run dot click it will be converted to a json json format it's going to be a client server architecture so the json format will be sent to the bootstrap.jar and it can communicate with the android phone using ui automator so internally uh, the apm use ui automator for the android one if it is less than 4.2 it uses the selenroid in ios it uses the xui test for a uh, more than if it is ios is more uh, the version is 9.3 plus it uses xui test and if it is less than 9.3 it uses the uh, ui automator so uh, there are uh, so let's imagine uh, your app is application is purely ios application okay so uh, if your development team writing the automation testing using ua automator they can do it it's possible with them if it is only a single ios application so when xcode 8.3 introduced so apple deprecated the ua automator so what it means that the end test cases you need to rewrite it on xua test so with apm it's, it's still it's okay because uh, uh, the apm guys has built a wrapper around this so all your existing tests will still passing on the ios 9.3 plus so instead of bootstrap.jar bootstrap.js will be communicate with the ui automator in ios so as a as a apm developer you don't need to care about how the ui automator works you only works on the client side so you just write the java or python or any other language so ipm will automatically take care of what action need to be performed any doubts so far no okay okay uh, just like i mentioned earlier if it is android 4.2 plus then uh, apm uses google's ui automator and ui automator 2 if it is between 2.3 plus and less than 4.2 then it uses the selenroid and for ios if it is if the device platform version is greater than 9.3 it uses xua test and less than that it uses apple ui automation so these are the four basic apm concept you need to understand so what it is 
the APM is going to be a client server architecture. So when you run the APM command, basically you are starting an APM server. So server will start on a port. So when you start your Java or any other programming language client, it will communicate through that APM server to the device. And if you perform an action, you will get a status, whether it's passed or not. And that's how IPM understands whether it's a pass or fail. Every, when you instantiate a driver, it, it will start a session also. So without session, you cannot work with APM. So the session contains all the details about the web elements, uh, what action need to be performed. Everything will be stored in the session. Once you install APM, you can run the APM server using the APM command. So you can select, uh, by default, it's going to be uh, 7423 port. You can override the port if you go for the parallel execution or you can add the device name, so many things you can add. So uh, all these things comes under decide capabilities. So let's say, imagine you have uh, two phones to test. Okay, uh, both are iPhone, and iPhone 5s maybe, and one's platform is uh, 11.0, the second iPhone platform is 10.0. So how do you tell APM that I need to run on the iPhone 5s whose platform version is 11.0? So that's where we are using the decide capabilities. So you can uh, send this using a JSON annotation. Then uh, you specify a platform name, platform version, device name, the automation name, the path to the APP file or IPA file. So we are giving, when you start a driver object, we are specifying this. Then IPM will understand, hey, I need to run the test on this particular form. Cool? So you can just uh, go to the go to this link to understand more about CAPS after the session. Okay, so uh, have you guys completed the installation? Uh, we can help you if you haven't done. So everyone said the Java 8? Node? Android Studio? APM command? Uh, did you run APM doctor on your terminal? Everyone? If you run APM Doctor, it will diagnose the existing installation. It will give you uh, the status on whether you are missing any necessary dependent software or not. So uh, it's okay if you are running it on Windows. You, you, you on Windows machine, you cannot run the iOS test. So you need a Mac machine to run the iOS simulator and other stuff because you need to install the Xcode. So if you are running it on Mac, you will be getting a uh, status like this. Okay, if, uh, let me know if you are a, any of the a, any of you are not getting any Indo mark, which is a close sign. Jerry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you need to set up the Java home, right? Um, uh, this is not your... Uh, yeah, it's okay if you are not able to install, so we will help you to install during the lunch time, so we can go ahead with the session. So uh, once you set up everything, uh, we will try to automate a simple uh, test case. So how do you find the elements on the web screen? I mean mobile, mobile phone screen. So if you are using Selenium, you already familiarize with the different identifier, XPath, 
uh, CSS selector, etc. Right. So uh, likewise, for IPM, you can use accessibility IDs and expat same class name. You automated two syntax, iOS and NS predicates. Okay. Uh, so we will go through this. Uh, we will see how you can inspect the element. So on web, it's quite easy, right? So you just right click on the element. You just inspect the element and it will show the uh, HTML DOM structure and you can easily identify whether it has an ID or not. Or you can go with any uh, plugins you want. So for APM, uh, there is a tool to inspect the element called APM Inspector. So what APM Inspector will do, uh, it will open up the screenshot of the page and you can go through the elements there and you can identify whether it has an ID or not. So I can show you that. So this is how the UI look like. So this is the latest version of um, APM desktop. Um, this is an electron app, basically. So you know what an electron is? Electron, have you heard about electron? OK. So uh, before uh, the APM guys built this tool, um, there was two dedicated uh, project for Mac and Windows machine. So using Electron, you can have the same source code for both Mac and Windows, Windows machines. So it's like something like React Native. You can just one code. You can build on both iOS and Android. So uh, and the previous version was so buggy. Uh, and it was not working well almost of the time. But this one is pretty cool. And it worked like a charm. So uh, we will start with the simple one. So when you click on the Start Server, If everything installed correctly, then uh, it will start the APM server. So I'm using version 1.7.1, .1 and it began to listen at the port 4723. So the default port is 4723 if you are not specified the port, which means that when you start the client, you need to point towards this URL, then it will keep on listening. So you can see there are three buttons on the right side. First one is uh, start inspection session, get raw logs, and the last one stop server. So we're going to click on the start inspection session. So it will open me another page. So there are a few options, uh, automate, automate, automatic server, custom server, or if you are using uh, the party cloud like source lab or test project, you can use that one. So we will go with the autom automatic one. So uh, the automatic server will always point towards your local host, and the port is 4723. Okay. Uh, then I have created a few desired capabilities for we'll start with Android. So what I have given, you can uh, just uh, click on the plus button, then it will ask you to start a new, uh, new desired capabilities. So you just, you just uh, add the desired capabilities according to which phone or simulator you want to start your session. So here I have given. Uh, my Android virtual device is Nexus 4 underscore AVD. Platform name Android. Automation name is UI Automator 2. App is the path to the APK file. 
and device name is emulator-5554. Uh, I will show you how did I create the emulator. I'm going to start uh, create a sample uh, Android project. Just click and select the basic activity and keep all the default values. So we have started a sample project. And um, if we click on this one, uh, sorry. AVD manager can show you. So I already created a uh, emulator here with the name Nexus underscore four underscore AVD, and which is AP is uh, 23, which is 6.0 equivalent. So you need to give uh, if you are running on emulator, you need to give the AVD name as Nexus underscore four underscore AVD. You can give your own name there, but if you want to call this specific simulator, you need to give this name. Just let me run this and see what happens. So I just run this. I have this simulator with me. Okay. So uh, if, if I run ADB devices, I can see that the emulator name came on here, which means that this is ready with the, all the USB debug connections. So I can start using it. So uh, if you are using the real device, so IPM support both emulator and the real device, okay? So if you are using a real Android device, what do you need to do? You need to do some extra steps, like you need to enable the USB, USB debugging mode, and you should accept it. And when you run the ADB devices, the UDID of the phone should be coming here. If it is in unauthorized states, you cannot run it, okay? Okay, so okay, let me close it. Okay, I'm just uh, starting the APM inspector again. And just minimize it. So uh, again, it's start with the four seven two three port. I'm inspecting it. Okay, so here is my capability that I already saved. You can also create something like this. So uh, you can just start the session. Oh, error. So, the, what's the error showing? The APK file is not found, right? 
unknown server side error. So probably this might be a wrong path. So I have the APK file with me. So build AWS dot APK. So I, I'm going to reuse this uh, Amazon device from sample project. So I already built the APK for this one. And I'm going to edit this one and add AWS dot APK. And let me save it and start session. So you can see that it's successfully running. So the APM will uh, try to connect with the emulator. So you can see the, all the log files there, what it's trying to do. So if you closely watch it, you can understand how the APM works, what are the actions that being carried out. Uh, basically, it interact with the ADB and get the connected device and we'll check whether the device that we have given in the desired capability is present or not. If it is, yes, then it will try to install the APK file on the emulator. So yeah, so it's 200 status. So yeah, that's it. So if you check the emulator, yeah, in emulator also the app has been started. This is the home page of the app. So the same screen you should get in the APM inspector. See, got it? So uh, what I wanted to do is that, I, there's a, you can see a menu there. So I want to click on the menu. So in order to click the menu, I need the identifier that for that particular menu. So how can I inspect that one? So here, if you look at the app source, you can see uh, it's just like an uh, XML DOM. So you can see the relationship between all the elements here. So basically, APM will render the UA element as an XML here. If you really want to see what What's the ID of this one? We just select the select element tab here. Click here. So you can see that it will be highlighted. So this is an Android widget image button with the content description reference app. OK. So if you closely look at the right hand side, sorry. Yeah. So uh, this is more handy, like it has an accessibility ID order. So accessibility ID is reference app, and it already give you the XPath expression. Then there are some other attributes, like what's the index, the class name, package, the XY coordinates, so many other things. OK, so, uh, so my experience is that you shouldn't use the XPath expression. It's very expensive for IBM to find out the elements. OK, so it need to do a lot of extra things. Uh, the good practices will be your development team should give you the accessibility ID for all the, all the IDs. OK, so if any of the element missing any ID, you can request the dev team that, hey, I am missing this ID. So could you please uh, give me an ID for that one? So you can always do that. So uh, you also can do it if you are familiarized with the project, how to do the Android development. So if you want to click on it, what you can do, you can do something called drive. So how do you find out uh, ID, an element with ID in Selenium? Driver dot find element by ID, just pass the ID, right? Like this, you can do something like accessibility ID. So you just write driver dot find element by accessibility ID, just pass this expression, reference app. It's as simple as that. So. Uh, you can click on it. Let's say you select it and you click the tab here. It will perform the operation. So it will try to click on the app. It will open again. OK. So in the new page, you can see that, uh, or you just refresh it, it's not coming up. So if you refresh, it will be the new XML structure will be coming based on the menu or the current state of the page. Got it? Any doubt? OK, likewise tab, you can uh, type using the same key commands. You, you just select in uh, what, uh, the text field and send keys, so it will be typing over here. So I can do that example. So I think I should go to input control and tap on it. 
then there is a text field okay so i'm selecting the text field and i'm clicking the send keys and i click on type so it's already there i'm sorry the simulator is hidden so we can see actually here it's been typing so it just like the send key send keys command on selenium so you need to find out which element you want to play with and just send the send keys command it's simple as that and you can do record also with this apm inspector but uh, i suggest don't go for it because uh, it's in uh, people think that when hearing about automation testing the first question uh, faced always like can i do record and run and just use it if you are an experienced tester then you would say no because the tester so flaky if you are using the script that you get from the record and run so you need to have your own framework on the top of it and you need to have matured uh, test scripts also so you need to handle it properly you cannot simply use the way you got it from the record and run so i can show you an example how you can record it um, let me see so uh, again there is an option for record so this button it will start recording everything so you record it then i'm going to click on it tap then i'm going to click on input control again tap then i'm going to okay the same hello so you can see it here okay it's there so if you look at here so you can see that the code has been already generated here so you can convert it to uh, python or ruby uh, framework so if you select ruby then it will give you the ruby syntax for the recording so the same for the javascript so we will uh, proceed proceed with the java client for this session so you can see that this is my code sorry So here is what I have captured. So the APM inspector find out that uh, the menu button has already has a reference, a reference app as the accessibility ID. So it will always go for the accessibility IDs because it has the highest priority. The second one, uh, and it will try for clicking it. Then the input, the, in the menu which selected the input input elements, right? Um, there is no dedicated ID for that one, so it went for the XPath. So the XPath for that particular expression is Android widget text view content description is equal to raw category name, uh, which is which will work, but it is not good to use. So I will show you why. So if you closely examine this app. Okay, let me... Uh, Post the recording and tap on it. So here is the sub menu, right? So uh, the recorder gave me an expression like Android widget text view and content disc description is row category name. Okay. But if you look at this one, input controls. Yeah. It's here. Everything has the same thing as the resource ID here. Uh, draw arrow, title, draw arrow. Again. There is no specific unique ID for each and everything. So it's a generalized XPath expression, which is very 
flaky. So if you are using this kind of session, uh, you may not get a consistent test result. So one option is you can request the dev team to add the accessibility for this element. Or what you can do, you can use the UI automator expression. Or you can, uh, if you really want to go ahead with XPath, you do the relative XPath. OK. So Jerry will be uh, talking about the how to use the relative XPath in the afternoon session. OK. So that's how you need to use with the, that's how you can use with the Android app. Any doubt on this? Identifier for? Uh, only the identifier. You need to inspect each element and you will be getting the ID. There is. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I can. Possible. So, uh, what, one thing you can do, like you can uh, tell the developer that, hey, for this one, I need this particular ID. So if it is there, then your test will be passing. Yeah. Uh, so once they check in the code and you get the new APK file, the new ID will be in the APK file. Yeah, that's what I'm telling. So let's say, let's imagine uh, you are using an ID X, Y, Z and developer changed it to ABC. Okay, so are you asking whether this will fail or not since you are... Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, you cannot do something like that. So it, IPM read the accessibility IDs from the APK file. So let's say the developer changed, the developer changed one ID, okay. So in the next build, you will be getting a new APK file. Got it. So in the new APK file, you will be getting another ID for that one. So if you are still using the old ID, then it will fail. So it's always good that you just tell the developer, don't change the IDs unless it's, it's due to some urgency or something like that. So it, it, the concept is quite different from the web application. So it's like... Uh, you need to, uh, web application quite simple, you just go ahead and hit an URL and you can inspect the IDs, right? For web automation, if you are setting up your continuous integration server or any other continuous testing platforms, you need to generate the APK files based on your daily builds. So every day your team add, is adding new code, right? So if you are testing the old APK file or IPF file, which means that you are testing the old code. So if you, are, if you are continuously testing it, then you need to get the new APK file every day. Okay, yeah. okay so, uh, so any, any other doubts on this one? Okay, so we can go ahead with iOS simulator. Okay, let me close this one and I already created another simulator for uh, iOS. So I'm using the iPhone 6 simulator and I need to change the app file. So I already generated the app file here. So, okay, so you can see the logs. So uh, if you compare the IO simulator with Android, for APM, there is something extra needed to work with IO simulator called WebDriver agent. So uh, you cannot simply interact with an Apple's device. So the Facebook has uh, done this WebDriver agent project. So IPM uses the WebDriver agent, and using WebDriver agent, IPM interact with the iOS devices. So IPM will try to install the application first, 
then it will install the web driver agent. Using that web driver agent, it is able to communicate with the app file. So first it will install the AWS device from sample app. Then it will install the web driver agent. Yeah, so it's installing the web driver agent. Then it will start the app. Cool. Yeah, this is how the application looks in iOS. So it, the UA is not similar as Android. So you can see that the same page has been come up with the uh, new XML syntax. So you can see that the it's starting with XEUA element instead of the UA automator. Okay, because the iOS use the XEUA test. So we will try to see whether we can interact with the iOS. So I'm selecting inboards. So the inboard and I am tapping. Okay, so I go to the text view. So just like Android, you can interact with iOS also. Got it? Any doubt on this? Okay. Okay, now uh we can just go to this uh, repository. It's a GitHub repository, and you can clone the project and set it up on your device, your machines. We can help you on that. the emulator. So if you clone this one, I have already included the APK file in this one. You can find it in the build folder. Uh, what question? Is APK file always necessary to start an APM session? Yeah. If you want to start an application, do you need to pass the APK file as a desired capabilities with Android? How many say no? How many say yes? Everyone, dust of everyone, he says. Yeah. Okay, so uh, regarding Android, right? So if the application is already installed on phone, you don't need to, if you want to start that app, you don't need to pass the APK file. In, uh, apart from, uh, I mean, uh, instead of the a APK path, you need to pass two other parameters called package name and activity name. So AP will check whether any of the app has this package name and activity name, and it will start that app. So it's quite useful uh, when you want to continue your test. Let's say uh, you are getting a build, and you don't need to install it every time. So once you install it, you can go ahead with starting with the package name and activity name. So you know how to get the package name and activity name of any APK? Okay. Can share. If you are using this command, so uh, if you go to the Android SDK and the AAPT command, and you just dump barging aws.apk and grab package name, then it will print the package name of that particular APK file. If you want the activity name, then you just pass the 
activity name. So there are two uh, dedicated desired capabilities for including this one called uh, package name and activity name. So just like you pass the device name, you just pass the package name and activity name. But for iOS, it's not possible. So if you just want to start an iOS app which is already installed, it's not possible. So you should always add the IPA or APP file for the iOS, iOS device. Java Home should be set properly. ADB should be existing uh, Android Home slash platform tools. Yeah, and the emulator also. Otherwise, it will throw an error. I will ping the desired capabilities which I used in the Slack channel. You can just copy from there. If you need any reference, you can have a look at the uh, Slack channel. So how, which are the desired capabilities I just used. So if you are running with a real device, uh, you need to pass the UDID of the device. So for example, if you want to run with a real device, real Android device, then you need to do ADB device run command. So it will give you an unique identifier. So you can add one extra identifier like UDID and pass that particular statement. So it will run on the real phone instead of the simulator. What do you think? Where should your test should run? On real device or simulator? Why? Okay, got it. Any other thing? Okay. Yeah, another perspective will be like, uh, none of your real users are using simulator in production, right? So you should always get it on the real device. So, and um, if you, are, if you are using a simulator or emulator, even though it mocked the OS, the hardware specification is going to be vary from each device to device. So some issues uh, cannot find using simulator, you can find it using the real device. You uh, started the PM inspector successfully. How many of you have done it? Please raise the hand. Uh, have you able to run the IPM inspector? Okay.
go to this project to download the APM desktop if you, if you haven't. So, just go to release and you can download the DMG or EXE file. Just uh, Google APM desktop and you can find out the download space. I think I have pasted in the Slack channel also if you are missing it. Setting up the web driver agent properly then you may get some error. So in order to set it up, what do you need to go? You go to the node modules. So this is the path. Uh, you go to the node modules installed and APM, node modules, APM XCUA test driver, web driver agent. I will ping this in the Slack. So if you are on Mac machine, then if you go there, you can see that there is an X code project called web driver agent. Okay. So you can open it and you can see the implementations. Um, the Slack one? Okay, sorry. It's not going. Uh, yes. Yeah, you see it. So if you visit this project, uh, you can see how you can set up the web driver agent. So what you need, you need to do, uh, you go to the project folder and run scripts bootstrap.js. So it will download all the necessary components for the web driver. Then if you want to uh, run your test on a real iOS device, you need to sign with your developer account for this project. So you can uh, share your developer's uh, Apple account also. So you need to sign in here. And there are two things there. You need to sign in properly. And the certificate also need to be installed. Then only the APM will work on the real iOS device. OK, uh, I cannot do a demo on this because I don't want to share, the, share my Apple account details. So I can share the URL for setting up the real device. So uh, if you go to this page, you can see uh, what are the steps you need to perform to run your test on the real iPhone device. So you need to download, install a few more uh, dependencies like iOS deploy, uh, lay by iMobile device, iOS deploy extra. So uh, once you have the developer account, you can set it up in two ways. One is manual configuration or automated configuration. So uh, you just give the development team ID and the code sign identity. You can get it from developer.apple.com. If you sign in with your Apple account, you can get these details. So you need to mention these details in your Xcode project. Okay. Then only the web driver agent will be try to uh, install the application on the real device. Why it's worked on simulator? Because you don't need any code signing functionality for the simulator. But if you are running it on the real device, you will get an exception saying that the code sign in error okay. Okay, so in order to do that, you need to do all these steps.
so uh, you don't need to do it now uh, this is this will take time i think uh, this is a subject for taking another api meetup itself so you can try it yourself or in the future maybe we can take another session for this how to set up the apm on the real ios devices for the simulator you just run only this command dot script slash bootstrap dot sh once you go to the file path uh, i already shared in the slack channel you can just go to the node modules apm xe ui driver then go to the web driver agent project so uh, in the web driver the yeah i can show you so here there is a folder called scripts so there is something called build dot sh and bootstrap dot sh you just run this one so it will download all the dependency for you. Yeah. It's already part of a uh, Facebook project, web driver project. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we just have a look at it, how the uh, sample code look like. So if you open it up, uh, maybe you can, uh, you can set it up after noon. So uh, we can just see what's inside this. So I have a very simple test. So the first one is Android test. So this is uh, the, the test is J -unit, basic JUnit test. So the before session will be running before you start the session, uh, test. And I have one test here, which is nothing but uh, just like uh, I showed you earlier. It will cl click on the menu, and it will click on the input control, and it will try to enter the keyword Singapore APM meetup. It's as simple as that, okay? Then, before we start, you need to start the APM session. So the one way is that there is an APM service builder command class. So uh, this service will automatically start the APM server on your machine if you are using this. So you just give something like this. If you are using Mac machine, then you need to give the main.js path here like this. Then you can call apm driver local service dot start. It will start the apm automatically for you. So the okay. So when you start it, it will pick up the random port. It it won't be seven four two three. It could be any random port. It will check. Another way is that you start the apm command on your local, on your terminal or command prompt, and you just give a URL like this. OK, so I prefer this method because especially when you go for parallel execution, right? you need to give multiple port. So it always good you use your own URL hitting instead of the service command. So what I have done here is that I have created the desired capabilities. So uh, you already done the desired capabilities on IPM desktop, right? You have specified what's the device name, uh, what's the platform name, etc. So if you are doing it Java, then you can create something like this. So desired capability, set capability. Then for the device name, I am adding as the emulator name as 5554. Then AVD, Nexus for AVD is something like if your simulator emulator is switched off, if you are adding this one, it will restart it. So if you are not giving this one, if your emulator is switched off, it won't work. So this line of code is uh, just for automatically invoking your sim emulator. Any question? No. Then you need to add the APK file path. So I already put the APK files in this build folder. So it will fetch to build aws.apk file. Then I'm hitting Android driver, and I am passing the URL as 4723. OK? Then I'm going to click on all these things. So this is just like we recorded earlier. So I'm going to run this one.
Yeah. So it's running and it trying to enter Singapore IP meetup. Okay. So test is passed. So I'm just asserting uh, once I enter the Singapore IP meetup, I am asserting whether the current text value is Singapore IP meetup. So you can just get the text attribute of that particular text element and you can get the what's the current text is there and you just assert it. So let me close the APM desktop. If you want to see the logs, then you start the APM APM command again. Okay, so it started on four seven two three, and uh, I'm going to run the same test again. So you can have a look at the command. So it try to find out which test need to be done, and it launches and it click on the menu and enter the text field. Cool. Okay, so the same test. Uh, we're going to do for the iOS one. So the difference is that instead of uh, invoking the Android driver, you need to call the iOS driver. Okay. So here is an example. So my device name is iPhone 6 and the automation name is XUA test. I have given the path to the application and I have given the iOS driver as running 4723. And I do the same thing. So the IDs are different for Android and iOS. So I'm going to click on input and I'm going to enter some values on this text field. Okay. So I'm going to run this one. So since I already started the APM session, so it will reuse the existing session. So it will start a new session there with all the desired capabilities that given. So it start the simulator here. Here yeah, it's starting. Then it will open the app and click on the input. And okay, I have added some extra step here to clear the existing test field. So you can see that it will do a long press and it will click on the selector and it will click on the delete button to clear the password. So If you want to look at the code, I can show you. So I have I created some method called clear text field. So what it do, if it is an Android, this is how we detect whether the current run is Android or iOS. So you can check driver instance of Android driver, or if it is iOS driver, if it is Android, you just specify Android driver. Then if I want to clear the text field, then I just need to click on the element first, right? Then the current version that we use is 5.0.4. Okay, so the latest beta is uh, 6.0 beta 2. So in 6.0, the a touch action class depre deprecated a lot of method. So if you are running the same test on uh, 6.0 beta, it won't work. So this will work only with 5.0.4. I will share you how to do how we how you can uh, migrate to 6.0 later. I can share you a link link for that. So I am instantiating the touch action class. Then I do a long press. Once you do a long press, then it will give me the option to select all, copy something like that. Then I am clicking on the select all element. Then I am clicking on the delete. So this way you can clear any text that present on a text field. 
Okay. So uh, by default, this will be the syntax for whatever be the iOS application, native iOS application. Th using this one, you can clear any text field. If it is Android, it's quite straightforward. You just call element.clear. Okay, you don't need to call any text text action. So it just you just clear the text field. Got it? Okay, so we have two tests for uh, one each e one test each for Android test and iOS test. So can you tell me uh, what could be the issues if you are writing tests like this? So this is my ender string on text field. That's my uh, test case. Is it a good way to do the script? Any any pros and cons you can see in, in this approach? Because we are testing the same application. What you have done? You have written two tests for Android and iOS for the same same test case. Do you think how you can how you can just write only single test case which will work on both? Android and iOS, so that you don't need to maintain multiple test cases. Pardon? A global driver factor. Okay. Like, commonly, identifying instances whether it's Android or iOS can be passed as a global parameter. Okay, got it. Any other way? Okay. Okay, we will discuss about this afternoon. Okay, time for lunch. Half food, guys. Yeah. So we can run this on your machine after you finish the lunch. The lunch is here. Yeah. Let's start. So my name is Jerry, um, one of the QA engineer in Carcel. So today I'm going to talk about the pain. So what's the pain? The pain is not physical pain. It's when you guys are using APM, and when you guys are using APM to writing test script, or uh, using APM inspect, and you guys will feel pain. Even sometimes you want to smash your laptop. So let's see some of the pain. So the first one is so the first pain is slow. So sometimes uh, some of the engineer uh, ask me or email me or Slack me, just talk about. APM is very slow. APM sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see some example. So some of the person, they will use this feature from APM inspect because APM inspect is just provide us a feature is which is just copy the express. So you guys already use the APM desktop and to launch the APM inspect before, right, the, in this morning. So there is a feature. You can just copy the XPath. It's like this, you can see. There's a lot of like uh, element type ap application, element type window, element type others. Actually, this is not a good case, I think. I, I believe you guys know this, one, this case. So um, I'm going to use the relative XPath. So like you can use double slash and you can just relative locate any element. Maybe that's has a bad way, but in a mobile application, right? Relative XPath is still not a good way because if you use XPath to get element from the mobile side, it's gonna be very slow. But uh for now, we need to insert a small advertisement is if you're using Selenium to automate 
automate doing automation, right? Um, there's a very good tool. It's called uh, uh, Relative Express, uh, which is a Chrome plugin. So you guys can just use that to get. Uh, you just you, you can locate any element, then you will get a Relative Express. So this tool, the creator of this tool, is uh, Xiang. He's just just now uh, one of the speaker. Yeah. I'm just talking about your tool. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's back. So next one. So this picture is uh, captured from the APM inspect. So I guess you guys already use the APM inspect, and there's a one um, component. It will show the all the attribute here. You can see the type enable, visible, X, Y. And but if you, you guys want to locate and find this element, right? So you can see there's without any ID, without name, and without any other useful information for you to looking for this element. So this is not a good case. So how we improve this one? So we need make your app testable. So how we make your app testable is basically is you can communicate with your team, with your developer, and to make sure they can add the accessibility ID, add the name or add ID, add, uh, add something. So this is the accessibility ID. Yeah, we just talk about this one uh, in the morning, right? So. This is the iOS locator strategy. Accessibility ID is the fastest way to find your element. So after that, you can use the predicate queries, and you also can use class chain. Does anyone see the last one? Last one is the XPath, because it's very slow. It's, it's not suitable for mobile application. So I don't suggest you guys use XPath. Yeah, just ignore this. So if you guys want to know about more details, iOS locator strategy, just can yeah, access this URL. Uh, why, we, uh, why I introduced this iOS locator strategy is because uh, sometimes um, your team uh, didn't got the chance to add the accessibility ID for you. So you still can use uh, the other way to find your element. So your second pain is unstable. So most of the time, you find you, your test case, once you test run your test case, your first time, your test case is OK. Everything is passed. But sometimes it failed. And sometimes it passed. So this is not good case. So how we solve this kind of problem? Uh, let's see some of the uh, bad cases first. This is uh, uh, sometimes you, you will see some of the uh, test engineer, they will write this kind of uh, test script. It's the uh, element one click and sleep five second. And element two click is sleep three. And send, key, send the keys and for username and sleep for. So this is not a good way. And let's see another one. So element one click. And I try to click again because sometimes I found this click doesn't work. So I try to click again and sleep five minutes, also five seconds. And I will check the page exists or not. If it exists, I click another one. So this is also a bad case for us. It's not a good way. How we solve this kind of problem? Because um, if we are you're always using the slip drive, you cannot make sure your app is, is let's say uh, you're doing the logging, uh, and you type, uh, you type the username, and you type the password, and you, you tap the uh, logging button. And sometimes, uh, 
because after you, you tap the login button, you need to wait sometimes to go to the log login page. Or go to the main page. Yes. So you need to wait the page loaded. So this is need time. You take time sometimes. So, um, but if you sleep like five seconds, and sometimes it need take like 10 seconds in your script, it will be filled. So you will find your, sta your script is not, uh, not stable. So how we solve this kind of problem? So basically we will use the synchronization. So Apium support two kinds of synchronization. The first one is implicit weight. What is implicit weight? So um, it actually is easy for you guys just started using the Apium is because implicit weight is a global timeout for when you are finding the element. So let's say, uh, you want to find the uh, element which is a uh, text box. So um, the page is, is loading, when the page is loading, right? Uh, the API will wait for your element exist or visible. Then we'll do something like uh, input uh, or send string or like, just click like that. So if you put the implicit way, if you use this way, we will just wait for your element exist. But this is the global way. So it will all the element, once when you find all the element, right, it will just wait like it, 20 seconds, if you set 20 seconds. So um, next one is the ex explicit weight. What's the difference between the previous one is um, Explicit weight is to wait for some specific condition happen. When some spe specific condition happen, uh, it will go to another way. It will just go to another uh, steps, go to next steps. So in this way, right, if you're, you're already familiar with the implicit weight and explicit weight, and you are doing a very large project, I suggest you guys using this way. Because uh, using this way, um, we, you can integrate this inside the page object pattern. So uh, Sharp is gonna uh, introduce us uh, how we use the uh, page object pattern. It's better to integrate inside. Okay, so even we solve the synchronization, we use the uh, locator, but sometimes you still feel very slow. Um, in this case, we actually can speed up again, because sometimes your test case is move very large, it's because we always adding test case inside our uh, test automation pipeline. So your, your execution of the time is, very, is gonna very slow. So we have to do that. So the first one is deep link. So sometimes you feel your test case is, you always like um, do the logging, you always go to uh, page A and go to page B, and actually you just want to test the page C. But the page, if you want to reach to page C, you have to like go to the page A, page two. Then after that you go to page C. So if you are not gonna do the end-to-end uh, -end UI automation testing, it's just uh, automation, UI automation testing to test some specific feature, feature. So we actually can use the deep link inside the APM. APM supports that. So basically it's when you get the driver object, you can just call the get method and to pass in the deep link, then it will just jump to the specific page. So this can be save you a lot of time. So you don't need to wait a lot of time on the page, jump to the specific page. 
Another way is use mock server. Because when we are running UI automation, a lot of time is also waste on the when you send some a request and you um, you finish some form request, like when you log in, you need to communicate with the server side. And this side also sometimes you need to take some time. So <coughs> we actually can use the mock server to replace that server. Then can save you a lot of time because mock server is your is set up on your local machine. Last way is parallel. So we actually can set uh, like uh, in a carousel, we actually uh, set a device farm. So you can just hand your multiple device and uh, connect your Jenkins server. So um, you actually can run a parallel way and to speed up your test case. So I prepared a bonus demo. It called the new workflow APM client. You, you guys know the APM support any language, right? Any language is because APM is a protocol. It is a W3C web driver protocol server. So any language can support this is because any language just called just send request to this server, and you can do the test automation. So let's see the demo. Does anyone uh, know the workflow application on iOS? No one used that. OK. Um, Sorry. Uh, I need the iOS cable lightning. You have. Yeah, lightning cable. Anyone has? Thank you, thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, it's okay. It's fine. I don't need to use. Okay, this app is called uh, Workflow. Basically, it's 
Yeah, um, previously it's a, it's, it's a small company, then they quit this app, and after that Apple, they just bought this company, and now this app is under the app, Apple. So uh, this tool is actually is an automation tool on the iOS platform. So you actually can automate a lot of things there. Um, like you can find a lot of the automation step, like find the photos and choose from list and share something. Um, so now I'm going to use these tools to automate um, by IPUM. Let's, let's see the demo first. So I tap wrong. So it just input to and try to compute the sum. Now the value is 5,000. So uh, basically is the script is here. So you can see the first one is text field one. It's basically is uh, accessibility ID for the first control. And uh, I use comma. And the second parameter is the 2000, which is the value I want to input inside this control. And the second line is, yeah, which is the second component. And I'm trying to input 3000. And last one is i trying to get the button, the compute, compute some button, and trying to click this one. This, uh, um, if I doing some different things. Okay. Then let's see something different. You will clear the first one and you have to clear the second one and tap the button. Okay. So this demo is, is done. So why I need to show this demo is because I want to uh, let you guys know Apium is a, actually is a server. So you can use any tool, any language, any other stuff just if you follow the W3C protocol, then you can control anything from the APM side. Yeah. There's one more thing. It's the APM Pro. So this is, you guys can see the last line is the website. So this website is very, um, good way to you guys to start learning the uh, APM is because this website is created by the main architecture of APM. The man is called uh, Jonathan Lips. Yeah, he's a master. <laughs> okay, so my set is done. So any question? If no question, uh, then we can follow just next steps, uh, Sham side. You can take it. Thanks, okay. You can take the laptop. Take it. Oh, yeah. Correct. Hello? Yep. Just this. <coughs> so, uh, what are the common just days, uh, you will perform when you do the mobile testing? Tap, swipe, etc. Right? So, uh, we will see how we can do this with APM, how we can swipe and how we can scroll, etc. So, you can have a look at the code. 
So, if you go to the gestures um, folder, then you can see there is a touch action class. So, uh, what I am going to do, uh, I am going to open up the app and if you look at the native components, then there are um, some fields you can play around with scrolling and swiping, swiping actions. So we will see how you can do it. Please note that all this code will work uh, only with Java client 5.0.4. If you are using the latest beta, there is a lot of deprecated methods, then it won't be working, okay? So the uh, common uh, approach behind uh, the scrolling is that the entire screen we will be taking at x, y axis. The horizontal one is x axis, the vertical one is y axis. So it will start from 0, 0 position. So if you want to swipe from, swipe from right to left, you input coordinates x1, y2, x2, y2. Then what using the swipe from command, what IP will do, it will try to swipe from right to left. So you can just mock the action like that, okay. So if you open the APM inspector, we can still do it. I will show you how. Okay, so let me, let me kill the APM session, starting it. the Android. Okay, let me start this one. Okay, so let me click here, native components. Okay, so from this page, right? Uh, yeah, maybe input controls. Uh, so you can see another components here check button. So you can do a swipe here. So if you do a right swipe, then it will move to the next component. So how can you do that with APM? So let me refresh and go to the current screen. If you look at, there is a tab for swipe by coordinates as the second button. So you select this first and click on the first coordinate. So it is X584, Y738. Then click on the second one. Then it will swipe it. So how it detects, this is the zero, zero position. You can see the XY coordinates. And this, is, this will be the width of the screen. This will be the height, right? So you can write a method which finds uh, maybe 75 percentage of the width and 25 percentage of the width as the y-axis. If you take the x at center, then your uh, x coordinates going to be the same one, right? So what I have done, I have, if you look at the swipe from right to left, I'm getting the device screen size. So. If you are running on a different simulator or emulator or any other device, your resolution going to vary, right? So you need to capture the device size runtime. So what you can do, you can do something like this. So you take the first root element and you fetch element.getSize, get width, element.getSize, get height. So like this way, you can get the uh, width height as an integer array then you get it in this variable, okay. So here what I have done, I am going to define my start x as 90 percentage of the width, start y as 20 percentage of height, end x as 10 percentage of width, and end y as same as uh, start y. So let's imagine how it works. So my y component is same, which means that y is the vertical one which means 
it's 20 percentage of the void right so it will always the, for the two coordinates the y components all good game means it is going to be a horizontal line same as x axis and just like we saw in the appian desktop we're going to give the first point and the second point so what appian will do it will swipe from right to left so the screen will move here okay so the same principle you can apply for scrolling the only thing is that uh, your x1 x2 y1 y2 components going to be right you need to define like it's going to be a vertical swipe so if you look at here say from top to bottom i have the same start x and end y as with by 2 the only thing that start y and end y going to vary so it's all about giving the correct coordinates to the apm and it starts swiping but most of these uh, methods are getting deprecated so if you want to have a look at it how 6.0 point beta support all this function you can just go here okay so i will share this along with the slide so if you look at how the new client handles it let's say horizontal swipe right so this one imagine that uh, there will be a slider associated with the scope so we need to find the slider first then you need to call the touch action like this so you you are passing the slider element and height and height of, height of the zero is the x1 size dot height divided by 2 is this y coordinate with respect to the slider so you can have a look at it uh, once the workshop finishes you can try it using the new java client and see how it works so this repository is also a fine example how the word qwade and the advanced rapm session so there are some already there are some uh, app file and apk files you can play around with this one so i suggest you also have a look at it this repository and practice your rapm tutorials so i can share this here okay so i want to run this test okay so uh, in my base test i am just calling android first so when i call the android capabilities uh, i am just initiating the android emulator that i just created earlier and in the test text i am going to do a test where uh, if it is an android then i go to the native components i gonna do a right swipe then i do a left swipe then i gonna swipe again do the same thing then i gonna swipe to the bottom and back okay so we will see how it looks i'm starting it should fail most of the time i mean i didn't start the apm server did i yeah i already started with here so it should be working yeah so if you look at here then it's swiping then it do its left swipe then do it again then i swipe to the bottom i do it once more then i scroll back to the bottom again one more scroll back yeah that is passed okay so uh this is the same principle you need to do for the ios also so i was also the swipe using coordinate should work we will see how so i'm just commenting the android caps and enabling ios caps so here i am just starting iphone x iphone 6 sorry so i'm running the run again uh i just ran the wrong test sorry i need to run this yeah mm one second eh? yeah. so 
so it's starting okay here you don't need to this one will be working And it will try to install the app and the web driver agent. Yeah, so it's installing. Yep. Okay, so it try to click on the inboard and swipe okay swipe left again uh, for the scrolling I need to navigate to an another page so I will do that one yeah so scrolling I can scroll down Scrolling? Uh, yes, so you can actually, yes, possible. So what do you need to do? Here, right? So uh, here you can add the, um, in how many seconds you want to actually scroll. So some waiting speed, something like, if you want to scroll in one second, two second, three second, you can show, I will show the example. Mm. Okay, so let me open this one. It has some nice example. Okay, so if you look at the Java uh, 6 beta, so you can add something with, with duration. Okay, with duration of seconds 2 which means that the scrolling will happen in two seconds. So if you want to get a much delay, you just change here. So it will be working. Can you go in seconds or it's just in seconds? Uh, it's in seconds, yeah. And uh, the scrolling with the coordinates actually, uh, it's getting deprecated. But I have seen there is a bug associated with it. So it, it's being fixed in the latest beta. So. If you want to get a stable build, you can go with 5.0.4 and the current build, build, when it's become stable, you can go for the Java 6. That's what I suggest. Yeah. Yep. Yes. That's what, I, that's what I explained earlier, I will show you how. So I have a get device screen size, okay. So what it do, let's say runtime it's finding out the x, y coordinates. So if you look at the Android and iOS just now, it's going to be very, it's not going to be the same. So we're going to take like 25% of the width or 80% of the height, something like you go, you can go for. So you don't need to hard code your coordinates. Yeah. Any other doubts? Clear? Okay, cool. Okay. So long press I already explained during the uh, first session, how we, we clear the text field, right? We just call the long press and press the button and it will work. So it will work only, uh, most of the time you can play it with the text fields. Uh, no, I didn't prepare for the double tap. Actually there is function for double tap, you just do it. So it's same as tapping twice in a, with much higher speed. So there is a dedicated. Oh or using two fingers. I uh, know I didn't prepare it actually. Maybe, 
Uh, I just need to check that one. I need to confirm that one. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you can go with the page object model. So any of you has worked with page object model design pattern before? Okay, so can you explain uh, what's the advantages? Is to reduce the code. Okay. Uh, Reusability of the same code in multiple places. Yes. So, for example, if you have an element like uh, a login which is used across multiple mm. tests, so if you can write a method for that particular thing using the page object model, yeah. uh, as a traditional model, uh, you will write driver dot find elements in each test. But when you go for page object model, you are going to just call the method of the particular uh, element and you will be reusing it. Yeah. So if there is a change in future in regards to the element also, the values, it can be changed at one in one places and it will be reflected in all your test cases. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, the goal behind the page object model is that you can categorize your object repository in much cooler way. So you can extract all your elements ID from your test. We can keep it separately so you can manage it better way. Then in page object model, we're going to split your test cases into different pages like login page, home page, etc. So you don't need to write everything in a single suit. So you can split your test cases based on your functionality or your pages. So if you are defining the log, let's say you are defining a new class for login page. So the component associated, it will be most probably uh, the username field, the password, and the login button, right? So all these, all these things you can associate with that particular page. So in the future, if you want to change something, it's quite easy. If it is associated with the login page, we just go to the login page Java class and just change it, okay? Then write one test and run on multiple platform. So it's quite easy using annotations what you can do with page object model. Let's say you have an app which works on iOS, Android, and web. Okay. So what you can do, you can write a single test which will work across all the platforms. For example, the login page. You have an app in your office and uh, take the example of login. So how do you write a script? You, are, you have a test case like once you log in with the valid username and password, you should see the home page. That's your test case, okay? So how can you write only one test case and you can execute it on all the platforms? So that's where the page object model will help us. Then <coughs> if you are, uh, sorry. So if you are designing like this, it's quite easy to migrate to other, other, other testing framework. Like let's say you have page object model and currently you are using JUnit. So you want to migrate to Cucumber or TestNG platforms. So it's quite easy for you because you have extracted all your object repository and other steps to different packages. The only thing you need to change is how the TestNG test need to be implemented. So it's quite easy for you to migrate. Uh, okay, I will show you. So here, I will take the sample example. So I have a test here called ender text test. <coughs> so we're going to do the uh, alien example like uh, you're going to click on uh, the input text field and you're going to enter something. Okay. So here I have two packages extra. One is called objects. The second one pages. So for this test case, I'm going to deal with two pages. The first one is input controls page. The second one is home page. Okay. So if you look at the home page, in the constructor, I have something called page factory initialize elements, new APM field decorator. I am passing the home page object. So if you do like, do like this, if you instantiate the home page object, all the elements will be initialized. It. So where do you keep the home page object? So I have created a, another class called home page object here. So if you look at this one, I have written all the elements like this. It's no more diver dot find element by unhard code your xpath or id. It's something like this. So what I do that using android find by and ios find by annotations, 
I have done something like this. So it means that for this menu button, if I am running an Android test, so it will try to find the element using this one. So it automatically finds out the element based on the thing that you have given here. Okay. So let's say, imagine you want to run both Android and iOS. So you can have multiple annotations here for I Android and iOS. So the only thing going to vary is on which, which is the syntax you're going to use. You're going to use uh, which chain of elements like ID or XPath or accessibility ID. You can give here. If you have a web application, again, you can use something on the top of it, something like uh, find by. That's it. So if you use find by, it's going to be uh, ID is equal to ABC. It's going to be for the web driver. So you can use the same script as long as you are using this particular element for your test automation. You can do it for web automation also. Got it? So there are multiple annotations here and iOS find by, uh, iOS XE UA test find by, iOS Android UA automator. So, uh, so this is something uh, you can use across common like if it's an and iOS then just use iOS find by, uh, give which uh, type of uh, method you're going to use and just enter your input here. So if you do like this, runtime this elements will be instantiated. When you call uh, the home page object and when, when it called call the object, this constructor will be executed and it will instantiate everything. Okay. If you look, I will show you how it works. So in my test, I have created the home page object. Okay. So if, when I create the home page object, what it do? I am passing the driver. So where is my driver? My driver is in the base test class. So I have defined uh, the driver like this. So I am instantiating the driver on before suit. So when I, when I start the test, I will get the value of driver here. And I am passing it here, home page. So I have my uh, Android, Android driver ready at the time where which this line being executed. So it will go here. Then it will initialize all the object associated with that particular page. Okay. Then what I do, using home page, I am calling click menu. So I have a method in home page called click menu. What I do, I am waiting until I see the menu button. Okay. So I have a, I have a clear, I have a generator method called wait for element visible. So what it do, it will create an explicit wait of 20 seconds and it will wait till that particular element is visible. Okay. So before I do anything, uh, any action, I just need to ensure that the particular element is visible on the page. So I do a click. So using menu button, menu button already I defined in the home page. So I can just do a click. Then you need to return the page object. So this is the basic concept. So let's say you are doing a login. Once you login successfully, you need to see the home page, right? So if you are writing a login login method, what you can do, you can return the home page up from up once 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 the test is done. So since I clicked on the menu, I am still in the menu page. I can return the home page itself. So using the home page again, I click input control. So the same thing happening here. I'm waiting for input control. I click on input. I'm returning the input control page. Here I am returning another page. Again, the same thing will happen. Like when I, uh, if I using this object, if I call input control, then I can enter text. The enter text method is part of input control page. And you can just send any keys and it will return the input control. So, uh, sorry, there is a fire drill. So it will be for five minutes, so. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, your uh, attention please. In a few minutes, we will be testing the fire alarm and other firefighting equipment in the building. 
All the lifts will be granted for 10 minutes. Please do not be alarmed. Thank you. Mm. Another software, not software engineering, but it's again testing. So I can just write the method just like a chain of methods and I can just do it instead of uh, writing the typical way like driver dot find element, something like that. I don't need to hard code it anymore. So if you look at the page object, then I can see this is going to be your object repository. You just extracted all your elements ID to a single package and it's quite easy for you to handle. Okay. Yeah. Then you just assert it and see whether it's working or not. So I'm going to run this method. Okay, it clicks. Yeah, that's it. That's passed. So if you want to run it on iOS, then it's quite easy. The same thing you can use. The only thing going to vary is that instead of calling the driver object, you need to instantiate an iOS object. But here you are not touching anything which means that the same existing method you can just reuse for iOS. Yeah. So basically you are not changing anything in the test case related methods. Here you don't need to change as long as the page looks same. If there is any issues, uh, for example, on the iOS app there is no menu button, right? We are directly clicking on the input text from the home page. So that kind of things you need to handle. So you can do something like if driver instance of iOS driver, then skip this portion, something like that you can write. So as long as both iOS application and Android application having the same UI, you can go with this one. Yeah. Yeah. So usually from the page of this file, mm. the properties and the behavior goes into one class. Is there any reason like separate pages and separate Oh, okay. So, uh, if you if you don't want to use the page object right so i mean not splitting it into another package you can still use it so what you can what, what how you can do like so instead of defining the home page here you can do something like this okay but the thing is that you need to bring down all your elements into the home page class this will work over so uh, it it's depends on you, like uh, you, either you want to keep everything on the home page or you can split all the repos all the elements to another class. Also for the properties, like Android, mm, Android, mm, Android, 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 mm. Android, the accessibility ID will be, those properties will be common for you guys. Yeah. Only the behavior will be different, right? For example, uh, when you clear in Android, okay. you clear yeah. in the other, yes. behavior will be Yes, correct, exactly. So you can handle such kind of things in a utility method or something like that. Yeah. Anything? Any other doubt? Which I didn't hear, sorry. Jerry, can you give the mic? Uh, I didn't hear, sorry. Okay. Oh, uh, okay, so uh, Android Studio we are not using. You need to use the IntelliJ or Eclipse. Okay, yeah. So uh, you can download the uh, IntelliJ or Eclipse or any other IDE for development and you can write the inbound. So uh, that purely depends on which ID you want to use. So uh, basically, it's a Maven project I set up. So you can just use any IDE which support the Maven. 
so it's quite easy. So if you look at the POM, uh, what it do, I am just using a few JAR files. One is Java client, that is 5.0.4, then I am using the test and and J unit. Yeah, I am just specifying 1.8, that's it. So you can ju just do the same configuration with any other ID, it will work. Now personally, I like to do it in IntelliJ. Any other doubts? No doubts? Cool. I think uh, we can uh, just rest of the time uh, people try to set up the repository on your local and we'll, we'll try to run it. And before that, I have a quiz time. So I just want to know how much you know about IPA from this session. So you are all ready? Okay. Please go to this URL. It's going to be fun. It's uh, Kahoot. How, any, any of you played Kahoot before? Okay, cool. And you guys know the fun. <laughs> Okay, uh, before we start the quiz, I just want to run a sample quiz uh, just to uh, make sure that you familiarize with Kahoot, how, how you can play it Ladies after this. So, uh, if you go to kahoot.in, you can enter this ID to join. And you can enter your username and it will be displayed over here. Please join. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Everyone joined? Hey, we have seven people right now. No, eight people. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's start. So, I'm gonna start the, how it works, like the costume will be displayed on here and it will show four options. So, what you need to do, you can click, there will be different symbol for each option, there will be four options to click. 
so you can click the answer on your phone okay on your phone only uh, only the different color will be displayed so you can just click on it but the question will be on here so you need to read here and answer on your phone okay okay start only two questions sir okay one plus one yeah okay so which is the answer so you can just click on your symbol so you got only 14 seconds 13 12 Okay. Uh, okay, so it's not three. I accidentally made it correct answer as three. It's okay. But this is how it works. Then, wow, Vera got the first. So even though everyone make the right answer, it will dictate the response time. So who clicked first? Based on that one will be it will be arranged the ranking order, okay? So you shouldn't wait to click you should if you know the answer you just click it first before anyone do it okay and the next question two by zero Okay, <laughs> to base is not zero. Cool. So we will. Wow, empty got first. Who is empty? Ah, nice man. <laughs> uh, okay, I just need to. Okay, I'm just starting the real quiz. Classic. So you can again go to kahoot.it and enter the new pin. So here is the new pin. You can enter this pin. Then start. One point seven point two. Okay, next. Actually, this is not a okay. It's a wrong answer. Basically, you can write with any programming language, but I accidentally added this one. Okay, cool. Wow, empty in 1966. Billboard just, just, just below. Oh, it's iOS 9.3 plus. Again, empty first. There is no such capability as scan ready. Again, wow. What happened to MT? <laughs> 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 okay.
It belongs to the US. Okay, you see costume. Everyone made it. Oh, it's not Google. <laughs> Just want to see who clicked the last option. <laughs> uh, nice. Okay. Okay. The first prize goal to be uh, who's will? Who is will? Oh, okay. We <laughs> <You> cheated. <laughs> nice. So, guys, you can continue with setting up the repository. We will help you. Yeah. Uh, you can just run it, the existing script, and I just suggest you to add one more test case, and we can help it out. So we can do something like go to any other page and just click on anything and just validate it. We can help you that one. So um, if you guys haven't um, set up the repo on your machine, please try to do that. Please at least try to run it, and then maybe try to you know either change a test case or add a test case. So that all of you at least have some hands on, and if you have any questions, then uh, Sham and Jerry will be around to help you guys, uh, you with it. Or if there's something that you, or if you already know Appium and there's something that you different that you want to try that you haven't tried before, uh, this is also the place to try. Then at least you know there's people who can help you if you get stuck as well. All right.